In this Chem 1A video, we're going to discuss interpreting electron positions as probability distributions. So this is your first step towards meeting the learning objective of being able to interpret electron positions as a probability distribution. So as you may recall, electrons are extremely small particles and therefore they have to be treated using quantum mechanics. This is the system of physics that allows us to explain the behavior of very small particles. And for chemistry, we're particularly interested in electrons. Some of the consequences of quantum mechanics are that we have quantization, which is the idea that certain properties such as energies only occur in very specific set amounts. And also we have the concept of wave particle duality, which is basically the idea that particles behave like waves. And so this system is really fundamental for understanding atomic behavior and properties. Also as a consequence of quantum mechanics, we have the uncertainty principle, which is the idea that you can't know both position and momentum simultaneously. So we can't know exactly where our electrons are and how fast they're going, which means that we can't really do a trajectory type calculation where if we know that information, we can predict where the electron's gonna end up later. In quantum mechanics, we don't have that information. And so what we have to do is describe basically our electron trajectories as a probability map. So we just have some sort of likelihood of seeing the electron appear at a given point. So what we're gonna discuss now are solutions to the Schrodinger equation. The Schrodinger equation is really the fundamental equation in quantum mechanics that describes the energy and system basically of, of a quantum particle. So we have this deceptively simple equation, which is H psi equals E psi. Psi is a wave function. That's something that we don't actually know, but we'll be solving for within certain parameters. And H is what we call the Hamiltonian that contains all the information about our kinetic energy and our potential energy of the particles. So again, this is sort of the simple form where I haven't written out any details. We're not gonna go into the details in this class, but essentially what you should know is that you can solve this equation exactly for one particle. For anything more than one particle, we're gonna to have to make approximations. And based on the parameters and requirements of this equation, we find that only solutions that have specific energies are allowed. So only quantized solutions are allowed. And basically this equation is going to be satisfied when you have a standing wave. So the idea of a standing wave is that basically you have a wave that's not changing in time. So in the circular sense, it would mean that basically it's going around and coming back to the same point. If it didn't, we would end up with what we call destructive interference. So the wave would overlap with itself and eventually end up canceling itself out and it wouldn't be a stable solution. So when we solve the Schrodinger equation, we're solving for these standing waves. And those standing waves are what we call the wave functions. Those are just mathematical solutions that describe the, the wave nature of the electron. And it turns out that the wave functions aren't actually the most useful thing physically it's much more useful to look at the probability or the orbitals. So the orbitals are basically just square of the wave function. So we take this function and we square it. And this gives us a way of talking about probability. So sort of how likely the electron is to be at a given region of space. So next, let's talk about a few key properties of wave functions. First of all, we need to know about relative energies of wave functions. So if you increase the energy, that corresponds to increasing the number of nodes in the wave function or the number of places where it becomes zero or changes sign. And this is easy to think about in one dimension, which is illustrated by this wave here. In this case, it has zero nodes. In the next case, it has one node. When we start looking at atoms, our wave functions are gonna be spherical. And so we may have a case like this where it's just a sphere and has no nodes, or we may have a case like this where we have two different kind of lobes and there's one node here. We would be able to tell that this second wave function is higher in energy than the first one based on that extra node. 
we will also want to be able to discuss the phase of a wave function. So the phase is basically just whether or not it's positive or negative. And the reason that this becomes important is that wave functions will interact based on their phase. They'll add together constructively or destructively, just like regular waves. And so this turns out to have very important consequences for bonding, which we will talk more about in future modules. As I mentioned, um, what we really care about is the probability. So thinking about which regions of space have sort of the most likely case of finding the electron. The wave function itself is just the mathematical object. Um, it's not something that you can observe directly experimentally. So the probability is really what we're thinking about here. And in this case, we're representing the probability associated with the electron around a nucleus, which would be at the center here, as a series of points. So where there's more points, there's gonna be a higher probability. Where there's fewer points, there's a lower probability. And as you can imagine, it would be very tedious to draw these sorts of pictures where we have the dots representing how likely it is to find an electron. More dots, it's more likely, fewer dots, it's less likely. And so it's very common to just represent them as a solid shape, which would enclose sort of a certain percentage of the electron density, such as 90%. So 90% of the time, you would expect to find it inside this blue sphere. And again, this is the, the probability of finding the electron in a certain region of space. And so in this example, we're looking at an electron that's basically spherically symmetric. So we could replot this as just this upper right quadrant showing the distance from the nucleus. And in more detail, you can see that basically this decreases as you go away from the nucleus. This is also sometimes plotted as just a single variable r. So again, that's this, this distance. It doesn't matter in this case which direction I pick. Um, in some cases it may. All I need to know is that basically it's got its highest density at the nucleus and then it decays as we go away. However, it turns out that that's only part of the picture. So the density here is greatest at the nucleus and then it decays, but we also have to account for the fact that if we're very close to the nucleus, the volume associated with that distance is going to be very small. And as we go out, the volume associated is going to get larger and larger. And so what's represented here is that same orbital on the previous page, but now it has lines and different colors in it to represent sort of the different regions as you move out from the center. And so the probability density, which is the same thing that we just showed on the previous page, is largest at the nucleus and then decays. The volume, that surface area, is smallest at the nucleus and increases as you go out. And so it turns out that the most useful function to actually look at is what's called the radial probability distribution. And that's what's represented in this last case. It's basically a product, it's r squared times the wave function squared. And that function is gonna have a maximum at the most probable radius for the electron. So that is telling us basically where it is most likely we can find the electron. And so here's just that, that radial distribution function shown in another way. And so depending on the shape of the wave function, that radial probability distribution function may include nodes. As you increase and go up in energy, you're going to get more nodes, and that's going to be reflected in this radial probability distribution function. We'll talk more in detail in the next video about the actual hydrogen functions, but here's just a sample showing how you would go from the probability map to the radial probability distribution function. So again, this gives us a way of interpreting where the electrons are gonna be most of the time. And you can see that as you go from this 1s to the 2s orbital, we're going up in energy because we're getting nodes. And it's also going further away from the nucleus where it's most likely to be found. And the same happens when you go from the 2s to the 3s, you get an additional node. And again, the, the maximum is shifted further from the nucleus. In this video, we looked at how you would interpret solutions to the Schrodinger equation. 
So the solutions to the Schrodinger equation mathematically are wave functions. In chemistry, what's most useful is this concept of an orbital or the wave function squared. So we will explore this concept further in the next video when we look at specific solutions for the hydrogen atom.